entrance to the exhibition is here, and symbolically, the Mio Viaduct leads you into the first gallery. This gallery is devoted to sketches and drawings. The drawings here start in 1956. Uh, that's Manchester University. They move on to Yale University and they track through the practices of Team Four, of Foster and Partners, and uh, the foundation. The idea of entering through a gallery about sketches and drawings is really the importance of the sketch and the fact that it's the start of so many of the designs that you will see in the main gallery that follows. Then what are the influences going back in time to the 1960s? And the 1960s was arguably the birth of what we now call the Green Movement. So the early works and everything that followed really uh, can be related back to these early influences. And here we have a timeline of practice. Perhaps six decades ago, the first practice of Team 4, 1963, and then charting as a timeline the evolution of what today is the present practice, and alongside it, but quite separate from it, the Norman Foster Foundation, working with students to anticipate the future. And then this wall of print is really uh, a testimony for the 10,000 names, the 10,000 colleagues who, since 1963, have made, through their contributions, made this exhibition possible. So we've come from the darkened space of the sketches, and literally the space expands here. Working with uh, Frederick Migaru, the curator, he encouraged the division of the exhibition into a number of sections. And the opening one is nature and urbanity, and makes the point that they're really connected. They're encouraging density, preserving nature, avoiding sprawl, um, setting, in a way, the stage for the wider exhibition itself. And here we have the early projects of Team 4, starting in 1963, and again, very much about preserving the landscape. Dense clusters, but with privacy ensured by design. And then there's an inevitable transition, almost uh, seamless, of the projects of the practice, starting with Foster Associates, which is really the birth of the present practice of Foster and Partners. This project for Reliance Controls was a transitional project from the Team 4 practice to the present practice and is very much the birth of a systems approach to design, the integration of system. This project was a pioneering project, both socially and technologically. This small um, amenity center which brought together dockers and office workers uh, was revolutionary. It introduced open plan uh, materials that were about conserving energy. Uh, it incorporated heat recovery. Uh, these were truly revolutionary in the very early 1970s. So going back in time to these early projects of the late 1960s, the early 1970s, how to communicate some of the ideas which at that time were really revolutionary. They're now much more mainstream. Harvesting energy through solar, through wind power, recycling waste to human waste to fertilizer. So I developed with the model making team the idea of a diorama. So you can start to see the dialogue between the systems uh, in the model and the sketches of that period. In the theme of nature and urbanity and how do you relate to a landscape, this very first project, uh, the first in 1963, of digging in a small gazebo um, into the landscape, has its reverberations many decades later 
in the Air Museum for Duxford, which is also a memorial to the American airmen who lost their lives in World War II. And again, dug into the landscape in the same way uh, the National Botanical Gardens of, of, of Wales or an elephant house in Copenhagen, all deferring to the landscape. Still under the theme of nature and urbanity, we have Mazda, which is a series of experiments, but essentially it's a community, a research a university in the desert in Abu Dhabi, and working with the climate, learning from traditional dwellings, and then combining that with the cutting edge technology of solar power and um, so it is today still that experiment 24 hours every day of the year and totally solar powered as a research community. There's a transition in the exhibition from one subject of nature and urbanity to the vertical city and you could say that the high-rise building is emblematic uh, of the modern age, of the modern high-density city. Along the way, we try to show some insights into the process of design, uh, the exploration that might be in sketches and drawings, as we talked earlier, but it might be in models which explore different aspects of the design. Here, uh, a high-rise bank in Kuwait. This is a model of the Commerce Bank Tower. It was conceived in the late 1980s, realized in the early 1990s. And it is the first breathing building, the first naturally ventilated high-rise uh, building. This design, which I did as a student, uh, at Yale when I was doing my masters in the 1960s uh, that I uh, eliminated the conventional central core was really the basis of the future uh, Hong Kong and Shanghai uh, bank tower in Hong Kong which for the first time in a high-rise building eliminated the traditional central core of structure and services and instead fragmented it and put it on the edges of a completely flexible loft-like space. This tower was conceived for Swiss Re in London. Again, in London it was revolutionary. It's a breathing building. The facade opens up. Uh, air movement is encouraged through the spiral. So it's working really like an aircraft wing, creating uh, opposing pressures, low pressure, high pressure drawing air through the building, reducing the energy consumption and also making it a healthier building for the occupant. This tower for Hearst at the time in sustainability terms uh, was pioneering and um, at a completely different visual level there is a certain resonance between these diagraded faceted structures and the early Brancusi endless uh, column with its beautifully uh, proportioned uh, rhomboid shapes. You could say in many ways that we have uh, in anticipating the future reinvented the nature of the workplace, reinvented uh, what a high-rise building is. It was a distinguished critic who said that you could divide all of our projects into two categories, skin and bones. Either that the building is an expression of its skin, its external envelope, perhaps smooth and streamlined, or that it might be the expression of the bones. And uh, you can find the same analogies in the world of sculpture, automobiles, aircraft, very much about the 1913 anticipating the wind tunnel that would streamline revolutionary vehicles like Buckminster Fuller's Dymaxion car. I worked with, with Fuller, affectionately known by his friends as Bucky, for the last 12 years of his life. So my creation of this authentic uh, version was 
really uh, homage to my mentor. And um, he's perhaps well known for the uh, Dymaxian structures, uh, the diagridded uh, structures uh, which you can see here in the solar house that we worked on together, um, unrealized but hugely influential as a prototype, and also at the time the so-called fly's eye dome, which uh, resolved the structure of a triangulated structure but with openings uh, that would transmit light and also air. So uh, again these are research exercises into an architecture which would work with nature, which would reduce uh, the amount of energy. There's an anticipation here of a future still to come. Over the 12 years of our working together, uh, one concept unrealized was the idea of climatrophis. And climatrophis would be like a big, almost transparent uh, structural filigree structure that would transmit light, air, and within that environment there would be nature, greenery, trees. Um, it was a kind of utopian vision of the workplace of the future. As we move along the models in this part of the exhibition, we're continuing the theme of skin and bones. And, uh, and the bones, the arch of Wembley Stadium is not only emblematic and symbolic of that historic past, um, but is the, literally the very structure expressed that is holding it up. By contrast, this, um, uh, this complex of uh, musical um, uh, spaces for the performance arts, the sage uh, in the north of England, is by contrast very much about the skin, the voluptuous um, form. Uh, and as we move from that to the Sainsbury Centre, very much the expression of the skin of the building and only its bones, its structure, revealed at the ends, like an, an extrusion. I was encouraged by Frederick, the curator of the exhibition, to create this model of what he sees as a very important project from the past. Unbuilt, it was a, it was a, a house in, in Hampstead. And as you can see, it's very much about the expression of the structure and uh, incidentally has a certain resonance with the structure of this building uh, which you can see uh, outside. Renault uh, again a very clear expression of a suspension uh, structure and an element of it here kind of writ large recreation of the of the corner module. This is an exploratory project by the foundation team. Uh, we call it the Grasshopper, and, um, and it's a part infrastructure, part of the pedestrian route of this um, Chateau Lacoste in Provence. And here, this is, in effect, an observation platform. But it's, again, very much the bones of the structure and touches the nature very, very lightly almost in the same way that this table, uh, which has certain affinities with the Lunar Explorer of the late 1960s, uh, again, touching the ground lightly and very much an expression of its, of its structure. I've always been fascinated by the streamlined forms of airships, of zeppelins. And there's a certain unconscious resonance between that as a flying machine and this air-supported structure, a temporary building for a firm called Computer Technology. We literally unwrapped this as a cube uh, of fabric and it was inflated to be the first uh, of its kind as, a, as an office building. This diorama is showing a project called Willis Faber. There's a dialogue with Ben Johnson's painting 
of the period, and it's, um, it's reimagining the workplace with amazing roof gardens, landscape, uh, great restaurants, uh, movement by escalators in the sunlight, uh, a mega swimming pool, uh, the introduction of flexi time uh, so that members of the family can come along and it's uh, out of hours use the pool, the facilities. So very much about a lifestyle, anticipating a lifestyle of the future. And this, of course, is in the early 1970s. This is the headquarters for Apple in Cupertino, California. You can see here the before model, 24 buildings, car park, tarmac, virtually no landscape, and its transition into one large building, which, yes, it's physically large, but in concept, it's really compact because it's bringing everybody, those many thousands, under one roof for creative connectivity. And it's freeing the landscape for 10,000 new trees, uh, acres of, uh, of vegetation, trails in the landscape for hiking, for walking, um, uh, for cycling. And, um, and perhaps it looks inevitable as a circular building in the landscape. But that was really, as you can see here, an insight into the process. These were the exploratory studies that occupied perhaps some nine months of time before the circle emerged as something that would answer Steve Jobs' ideal for what he called an internal pod. If the Apple Park was very much about how you create a healthy, breathing building in a suburban uh, setting, then the challenge was even greater for the Bloomberg headquarters in the middle of a busy city. And here you can see the external uh, kind of grills which, uh, which shade the exterior, but these are also filtering the air, attenuating the noise from the traffic outside. And so this breathing building, the air is moving from the perimeter to the very heart. And in this model, you can see that the heart is a, a spiral pedestrian movement within the building, encouraging uh, people to creatively engage with, with each other informally. Uh, so it's very much about the environmental systems, the ecology of the building, but also creating a better working environment and the combination of a ceiling which was created for that project, designed specifically, reducing the energy dramatically and working acoustically to enable the floors throughout uh, to, be, uh, to be warm uh, timber. Here we have a winery one of several that we've explored, this one in Spain, going back to the roots of, of a winery, working with gravity, interestingly, avoiding the mechanical interfaces between the movement of, of grapes. This is a, a very small project, a chapel uh, for the Vatican uh, in Venice, and again, uh, very much about working with nature. So what you're not seeing here is the extent to which this in reality is overgrown with honeysuckle, which is not only giving the green vegetation, the white flowers, but also very much about the fragrance of the, of the experience. This was a project in Madrid, and we presented this at COP26 uh, as the most sustainable project in the history of the, of the practice. It goes beyond all the normal ratings uh, to truly meet the climate objectives of the, of the Paris Agreement. Interspersed through the galleries are the screens which bring to life, for example, here 
the British Museum. So there you see it as it really is with the people moving through it. And here the early models uh, showing how we were able to reveal the library by cutting away a lot of excess buildings of no quality at all that had accumulated and going back in time to the original courtyard inspired by history. This is a, a project currently under construction uh, for the Prado in Madrid, the Hall of Realms, and it's peeling away the layers of history to reveal the original building, the oldest in Madrid, the original brick facade going back to the 17th century. And then uh, above it, uh, because the roof had to be replaced anyway, creating a flexible a uh, big span gallery for contemporary art and temporary exhibitions. The library in Berlin, the so-called Berlin Brain, it's very much about the enclosure which is breathing, is, is, is allowing a degree of natural ventilation, controlled uh, natural light. And, um, and here you can see the study model of the structure as it were, the bones of, of the building. Here we have the, um, the Reichstag, which was symbolic of a reunified Germany, and the cupola, which symbolically places the public above the politicians who are responsible uh, to them. So it's an exercise in a zero carbon building. It's a kind of energy manifesto for the future. Uh, conceived and, and built in the 1990s and again in the Reichstag an insight into the process so these models give you an idea of some of the uh, versions unbuilt which finally made uh, what is there in reality. Here a glimpse into a project displaying the antiquities in the city of Narbonne in the south of France. And here a glimpse into the process behind the Norton Museum. If individual buildings are important, then I would argue, even though I'm a, an architect and passionate about the individual building, that the infrastructure of a city which determines its identity, its DNA, think of it as the urban glue which binds the individual buildings together. So that leads us to planning and place, the importance of master planning uh, and the creation of spaces. Then, of course, there's a section on network and mobility, very much about the movement of people, goods, information, whether that's a transmission tower uh, overlooking Barcelona, whether it's an airport in London, in Beijing, in Hong Kong, but looking at ways in which this infrastructure um, can reduce energy and can work with nature to bring in top light, sunlight, uh, natural uh, ventilation. This model of Stansted is a reminder that this was the beginning of the reinvention of the air terminal to move all the heavy services, ducts, um, artificial lighting in the ceiling and to turn that upside down to open the roof up to natural light and that influence other designers, planners of airports. It become the new model and different iterations of that by our own teams over time um, the latest unbuilt in, um, in Mexico, other iterations here in Beijing, in Hong Kong, and Kuwait, a spaceport in New Mexico. Here we have buildings that very much relate to the whole network of mobility, whether it's a charitable project which transforms the education of young people through the discipline of rowing and here the Yacht Club in Monaco, and then the Yacht Club gives way to yachts, gives way to boats, the importance of urban furniture in the streetscape of a city, the mobility of buses, uh, the idea of how you might give uh, a more gentle identity to the filling station. 
from the design of boats into uh, the world of the, of the future. And um, our work with NASA on Martian habitats, the European Space Agency on lunar dwellings, and, um, and over there, the idea of drone ports for rural Africa. What they all have in common is that you use the local material, the moon dust or the Mars dust called regolith, to mix that with an additive and then robotically to create dome-like structures which learn from the, uh, the structure of animal and bones to create quite deep uh, but highly efficient porous structures that will withstand uh, small meteorites and the damage can be easily uh, repaired. And then um, the Norman Foster Foundation in Madrid working with MIT, with Keynes, the Center for Advanced Nuclear Systems, uh, on the potential for autonomous power, uh, a new generation of nuclear, but rooted in experience from the past, the micro-reactors. And micro-reactors are, in many locations, pioneered since the 1960s. But the new generation, something like this, which would fit in a six-meter container, could power an entire Manhattan block just parked in the, in the basement. Here, the futures section marks the end of the exhibition. For the first time, we can look at works spanning six decades. And several themes weave through the models, the drawings, and in most cases, images of finished buildings. There's a quest for light, lightness, and accord with nature to capture the beauty of the sky and views. There's the pursuit since the 1960s of what is now called sustainability in the forms of conserving energy and recycling, recycling waste and materials, recycling historic buildings, conserving precious commodity of land and encouraging the pedestrian experience by building compactly to avoid sprawl, respecting and learning from history and tradition, in short, the exhibition shows that we design with an awareness of the past for the needs of the present and to anticipate a future which is essentially unknown.